Welcome folks and thanks for joining me in this special video where I'm going to talk both lore and painting technique in this special episode of Davion Dropship Painting and Lore. So I'm going to go through my process of painting this dropship. This is the Geppard dropship from Hardware Studios, which I think is a fantastic model. I'm going to show you all the things I do to prep and paint and fix all my errors and like that one right there, and then eventually come up with something that's got, you know, masked and decaled and painted, I, I think to a pretty decent standard, and I hope uh, I hope you think so too, but I'll take feedback. But this is kind of gonna go through all my process of all the various stages and going into even the decals and the creation of the decals and the prepping them in the application and kind of getting this to fit and finish to where I would be happy to put this on a battlefield and you know, have it as either an objective or just terrain or whatnot. So we're going to start off by assuming you've assembled this thing and you've primed it. And there it is in all its glory and looking good. It's a good old Geppard or Leopard dropship. Um, and we're going to go through all the paints I use as well. So Vallejo White, I use a lot of Vallejo White. Um, an airbrush flow improver. That's kind of a thinner for the airbrush. And I tend to mix things in these little tiny medical Dixie cup type of things, but I don't always. Sometimes I put it straight into the airbrush. But here I go. I'm going to put some white paint in there. It's Vallejo Dead White, I think. I'll put the I'll put the paints and whatnot and all the products that I use right there on the screen for you so you can see what's going on. So I mix a fair amount of that airbrush thinner or flow improver as we call it, and I mix it up with an air or paintbrush. And you're seeing me move very fast there. That's because I've sped up the video because if we watched this whole thing soup to nuts, we'd be here for a hundred hours. I don't know how long it took to paint this thing, but a good amount of time. So I'm testing the consistency. And so I'll put a little bit of water in there. What I'm looking for is thin milk, the thin milk consistency. So clean out my brush. And we're ready to go. And so we're going to put this through my Badger airbrush. And that's when I knew I needed to update my airbrush, folks. This airbrush is old and it got clogged. And I bought a new one because I was not going to show you a painting tutorial with my old and busted master brand airbrush. So this is my new Patriot 105 airbrush. It's kind of a workhorse airbrush. It's not the best out there, but it's certainly not a beginner or like a a crappy airbrush. It's a good solid journeyman's airbrush. So here we go. So this is going to look like I'm just kind of flailing here a little bit, but I'm going to paint the bottom with a, what's called a paneling technique. It's going to look a little bit odd, but again, sped up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a lot of the black primer showing through on the edges of the panel. And then the middle of the panel is going to have a lot of the color on it. Now this really isn't a realistic paint scheme or a uh, method of painting. It's not what you would see in real life, but it does kind of accentuate where the panel lines are. And again, I'm this is moving very fast. This is sped up so that you don't have to tediously watch me do all this in real time. But really on the bottom, most of the time people aren't really going to see this a whole lot. So we're really going to focus on the top. We're not really done there. So we're going to do what's also called a zenithal highlight. So you're going to see me kind of put a little bit of paint on here from a zenithal, I usually come in at an angle. I'm not going to worry too much about the panels here, but I am going to do it a little bit. But really, I want the base color of this dropship to be white, and the front, the nose, and kind of lines along the side are going to be blue. So now you see me fumbling around like, okay, I probably should have worn a glove, a nylon or a latex glove. And here I go, kind of painting again. I'm adding layers of color, right? So it's going to be a lot brighter white than this and you know as I go around you're going to see me add more and more layers of color and kind of keep it even but again zenithal highlight trying to do a little bit of that panel highlighting and maybe putting a little bit more on the top than on the sides so that it kind of looks like you know the sun's coming down on it and you can see a little bit of highlight based on that and so again you're going to see me holding this drop ship um, uh, either by those wings because those have not touched paint yet, or you're going to see me holding it by the doors because eventually I'm just going to hand paint those doors. And that's me looking like I found like a little bit of lint or something on that thing. And so get that off there, scratch it off with my finger and just going to keep airbrushing around all those panels. 
House Davian, or also known as the Federated Sons, is one of the five major successor states in the Battletech universe. They're primarily French and English ancestry, and they're the largest faction in the Inner Sphere. They're kind of thought of as the good guys in the universe, though no one's really truly a good guy. They're considered a bastion of liberty, and there's a very hierarchical social strata. They're almost a monarchy. In fact, in a lot of ways they are. There's very strong nobility class, and there's class divides everywhere. Um, and they're also kind of decidedly the good guy faction. Um, they're often at war with their nor neighbors to the north, House Karita, and their neighbors to the southwest, which is Liao, and often with the Tarian Concordat. The Federated Sons was founded in 2317 by the scion of the Davion family, Lucian Davion. He was a master politician and very influential in the area. In 2567, the Federated Sons joined the Star League, becoming their fourth member state. The Star League era for the Davian household was relatively quiet and they enjoyed many hundreds of years of prosperity together. They were mostly supportive of the Star League in its early years until the Succession Wars broke out. Now, during the Succession Wars, after the Ameris Civil War, House Davian, as long as all the other houses just like them, devolved into Civil War particularly, like mentioned earlier, with the Draconis Combine, or House Carita, and the Compellan Confederation, also known as House Liao. So this dropship is starting to look pretty good, just getting a couple more layers of white, kind of getting the highlights going there. And once this is all done, we're going to go into the masking phase and start getting the blue on there. Okay, so for this dropship, I'm going to paint it in my Davian scheme that I've got federating, Federated Suns. So basically, it's going to be a um, blue and a white sort of contrast. So I think like my Davian mechs have like a blue top and um, white legs, middle, middle thighs, I guess, and then blue uh, shins and feet. So basically, I'm just going to do a white and blue scheme to sort of kind of match that, but I'm thinking... I'm going to do the front, the nose, and the canopy kind of like here, back, kind of like blue up here, and then blue along the edge here, and then maybe kind of a, a line down through here and down here, like the wing tip and the edge, leading edge tip of blue. The rest I'm going to leave white. Maybe I'll keep the top of this, I'll put the top of this blue and uh, the top of this blue, maybe even this edge of the um, engine intake cowling blue. But basically, I want to airbrush that and use the um, sh pre-shading that I did with the white to my advantage and just kind of spray it um, maybe multiple times with a very thin blue and kind of leverage the shadows and the highlights from the white undercoat um, to kind of give me that definition uh for the blues so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use masking tape to section off the areas that i want to um paint blue so basically i'm not sure if i can do this on camera i might be a little bit wonky with my setup but i'm going to do the best i can but i'm going to start by thinking about well you can hear me rolling tape in the background apologies for that um basically the idea is mentally map out where you want your lines to be and use kind of waypoints on the model to help be your guide. So you're not trying to eyeball it and make sure that it's the same on each side because you want that symmetry, right? If it's not symmetrical, it's going to look a little goofy. So really what I like to think about when I do this, and I did this on my Karita dropship too, is find points on the model that you can use as nav points. So for instance, what do I mean? I sort of want this entire top thing blue, and then I think what I'm going to do is um, use this line right here to kind of be the buffer. This is going to be blue and this is going to be white. So use this line down to here and then kind of make an angle down to say maybe here, use this line. You'll see what I mean in a minute, but basically take it from this point down to here, keep this blue and then maybe do this blue. And then for this, probably 
use that corner there as a waypoint, put it to that corner for the front leading edge, and then use this entire, um, use this line to sort of map out, this will be blue and this will be white. Let me show you what I mean. And then that way, if I use the same kind of rubric with a symmetrical model, each side is gonna look um, identical. So bear with me as I try to mask this thing off. So keeping in mind, um, I want this to be the blue side, this to be white. I'm going to use this. And I'm going to mask right there. I'll come back to this piece in a minute. But basically, press that in real tight. And then press that in. There. Now, I'm probably going to use my hobby knife. And I need to be a little bit gentle, but I don't need to freak out about it. Just kind of come in here. Slice that off. It didn't quite take. Let's see if I can do this again. All right, there we got it right there. All right, so that masks that masks that line off right there. If you can kind of see that, right? So I do need to kind of come back, and sometimes I'll do this with the tape. You can see that I need to slice that very gently. I don't know if y'all can see that. It's kind of hard to do this on camera, but we'll muddle our way through. All right, so I'm going to come in here and just follow the edge of the model and see how I made that cut. Now I can just kind of tear this away because I don't need it. And you're going to find you're going to be kind of patching um, pieces of tape on this until you get this get the um, the coverage that you want. So again, kind of come in here with this piece of tape along that edge. I'm using that as my guide post, right? I'm going to put that there. I'm going to move that down there, kind of pressing it in, get it nice and tight. And trust me, this um, I airbrushed this oh, a couple weeks ago at this point now. Um, so that paint ain't going anywhere, folks. Um, and you know, if you, if you're using decent paint, hopefully it's not going to peel on you. If you used a decent primer, you're going to be all right. But, uh, you know, who knows your mileage may vary. So, okay. So I just made a nice little cut there. Notice that I still need to keep that there because I want to make the blue stop at the top of that, um, bridge kind of cowling. So I'm just going to go like this. And move like that and hopefully that's going to help me now i've got my top line this is all going to be blue remember now basically i need to decide okay what waypoint on here am i going to use and i think i'm going to use the top of that door right you see that the top of that door right there and i'm going to come down to about here on this line these models are fantastic for this they've got nice little waypoints that I can use to define where the masking should go. So I'm going to come back with my model and don't worry about if it's kind of like spilling over into the blue area here. We can change that. Just kind of get your masking tape, get a line before you press it down too hard, get your line defined, right? And then press it down and we're going to come back and kind of um, remove that excess tape there. We're going to come down to there and we'll remove that excess tape as well. So now that I've got my line defined, I press in. This is going to be a little tricky. I might need to do a little bit of extra masking here because there's kind of a significant little divot here, but we'll leave that for now. Um, and come here. See where that tape meets? I'm just going to kind of make a little mark there and hopefully that comes across yep and i'm able to sort of tear that away so that works there i'm just going to put this here because look why not it's that that remember that area is what we want to be white at the end so i'm going to do something similar on the other side you kind of get the idea now this tape is probably going a little farther down than i need it to 
We'll deal with that in a minute. Kind of press that in. Okay, so using the guide post that I did before, it's at the top of that right there. And we're going to come down to that spot just to make it symmetrical. And I need to press that in. So this obviously is that line, keeping all of this blue. All of this up here is going to stay white because it's under the mask. Okay. Now we need to slice this off because that's excess. There we go. That came off. Now, this is going to happen. This obviously we want to get rid of because that area of the door we want to keep white. So, what do we do? Well, just like before, we're going to come in with our hobby knife. Just gently score that. So here's a good example of why you can kind of trust your paint to stick. Look, I've been pressing on that like nobody's business. That ain't coming off. Just like this, right? So I want to make a line that's congruent with that piece of tape that we set as our mask. Okay, now this is going to happen too, so this is good. You're going to get a little bit of excess that didn't come up. Totally solvable. You either cut it again and pull it away, or you tuck it up and away. Like, you can kind of flick this up. I don't know if you can see that. Sorry. Kind of use my knife, push that up, and look, when you spray this, it isn't necessarily going to be perfect. You might have to do some touch-up on the edges. And we'll go over that, too. It's not a big deal. But use your hobby knife. Try to be gentle. And find these pieces and pull them up. All right. Yep. So I'm going to clean this up. And then I'm going to keep working on my masking. And, uh, well, what the heck? Why don't I just do another one for you? Just so you can kind of see where this is. I don't want to bore you to death watching me mask the whole darn thing. But basically, let's clean that up. Get that pressed in there. And I'm probably going to come back with a little bit more tape because there is a significant divot there. I don't know if you can see that in the camera, but I don't want paint creeping up in there. All right, so, hey, here's a good thing to do. Um, we're at this area here. Now this needs to kind of stop right there. Now again, I can use the lines on the model itself as a good guide. Stops there. Get my knife in that groove and kind of make a slice there. That piece should come up and out. And that's actually positioned perfectly for me to Remove that little bit there. Perfect. That's really perfect right there. And so um, the next thing I'm going to do there is I can, I sometimes do this too. I fold the piece of tape. Like I don't necessarily want to um, spend a, line, a lot of time carving and folding and, or carving and pulling and whatnot. So sometimes I'll just fold the tape and then just kind of there, do something like that, right? So the next thing I want to do, again, remember, this is all blue here. This is going to be blue. Now what I want to do is probably take some tape and do a line down through here and then through here and um, do this wing and then flip flip it over and do the same thing uh, for the other wing. So I'm going to do that without commentary. I might speed this next piece up um, for your uh, just kind of watching so you can just kind of see how I do it, but you don't have to listen to me ramble. And uh, I'll show you the whole model when it's done. Um, being masked.
Okay, the model looks like it is fully masked at this point. So let's remind ourselves, everything under the mask is obviously not going to get sprayed blue. This is all going to be blue, right? Then we'll peel. You did see me make a little bit of a goof up. I had intended... Um, oh, and this is why we do this, because I can see there's a little spot that didn't get masking tape over it. I don't want, like, little random blue spots in there. Um, everything that's exposed is going to be a shade of blue. Uh, everything that is covered is going to stay that white. And so uh, once we get the blue on here, um, oops, we need to clean that up too. See, this is why you kind of want to do your pre-flight pre check, as it were. Make sure that your masking is on point. Um, I think we're in a good spot here. I'm just going to do that. There we go. Clean that up. Um, I feel like our masking is good. Let's kind of take another look at it. Make sure there's no gaps that, oh, see, there's one there. And, you know, look, if you make a mistake and you forget to cover something, it's not the end of the world. You can kind of go back over it. Just the whole point of the masking is so that you can have nice clean lines um, and not have to do a whole lot of extra work. So once I, um, this is all covered at this point. So the next step is for me to um, get this under the airbrush. And so that's what I'll be showing you next. I'm going to mix up some nice blue. Uh, I'm going to keep it really thin and kind of do maybe multiple coats of a thin blue to kind of get uh, a nice, um, you know, let the white kind of come through. And so you keep the gradient between the dark and the light that you made with your undercoat. Um, and hopefully that's going to look pretty sharp. And then we'll peel all that off. And then we'll, there's still a lot left to do after um, we do the blue. But this is re really what's going to make the model pop. So uh, stick around and I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, that um, Basically glazing with the airbrush and uh, get that really nice uh, kind of hues and kind of gradients going uh, through the undercoating. All right, so we've done our pre-flight check and we've set up our bench to do some airbrushing. Just doing one last look, making sure all those seams are tight. If you don't have your seams tight, you're going to get some leakage. So I'm using a Delta Coat Ceramic, Delta Ceram Coat, excuse me, an airbrush flower. That blue color is, uh, I'll pop that up here on the screen so you can see exactly what that is. But any royal blue or whatever color you want, you got to thin it down to get it mostly transparent so that the shading between the undercoats comes through. So I thin it with a little bit of Lamian Medium. So that's Thalo Blue, give that a good shake. Mix that with some Airbrush Flow Improver and some um, Lamian Medium to keep it nice and flat. And maybe a little bit of water. You really want this thin. This is almost like a glaze or a wash, but you're shooting it through the airbrush. This is going to really allow the gradients that you created with the airbrush to shine through. And you're going to get a really beautiful um, gradient with you know with the blue. So again, make that nice and thin. That paint is very thick, and so it this is almost like a wash, right? So you kind of put it up there against that uh, measuring cup and see that it kind of flows right off. And that's about where you want it to be. So getting the airbrush ready, got that nice blue. And again, this is sped up. I don't actually paint this fast, folks, of course, but um, seeing it get nice, even flow there. Even flow. Sorry, grew up in the 90s. All right, so we're going to start glazing the entire model if you spray over onto the masking tape that's fine that's what it's there for so we're going to paint the entire darn thing and kind of go over it and then let it dry a little bit and then just kind of move your airbrush quickly but evenly you don't want this to pool so and this is where that panel highlighting is really going to make this pop i know it looked kind of goofy like there's these like really stark panels on the bottom, but when we get a couple coats of this paint on there, this airbrush glaze, if you will, that's totally fine. That's what I'm trying to say there. Like, okay, I'm going to get all that paint out. We got one pass on that thing, so we're going to let that dry. So just cleaning out my airbrush. I'm going to give this a little, like you get one pass on there and just let it dry. Like if you try to do another pass on it while it's still kind of wet, that's when you're going to start getting runs. So I'm going to do a little back blow on my airbrush, get that nice and clean. Do that a couple times, just make sure your airbrush is clean. Get that all cleaned out. And while that 
that dropship is drying. So normally I'll allow this to dry, what, maybe at least 10 minutes, maybe a half hour, maybe more, and I'll come back to it, right? But we're just going to let that sit for a bit. Just let it sit. Oh, it looks like I'm trying to indicate something else here. Oh, yeah. Here's the other thing that you need to do. Between coats of blue, we are going to use eye makeup brushes to really make those edges pop. So here's my secret. So you can see now that that drop ship is nice and dry. You can hopefully see that it's pretty flat. So instead of putting another coat on immediately, I really want those edges to pop. Here's my secret weapon. Take a very thin white, like Vallejo airbrush white, get yourself a nice soft eye makeup brush and dry brush with that. Get almost all of the paint off. Get it on the brush, just get that paint, like and test it on your finger, test it on something, see that you barely get any paint. And then, eh, sorry for this, but you can barely see that, but dry brush the edges on this model. You see that where you're starting to get some edge highlight? Please, for the love of all things good and holy, don't try to do an edge highlight with the edge of your brush on every single panel. Get this dry brush. Do this on big models, do this on small models. Eye makeup brushes are your salvation. They're so soft. It's really going to put a nice fine edge highlight on everything that you do here. So again, get as much paint off that brush as you can. Dry brush all over the blue. Everywhere, everywhere there's an edge. Dry brush, dry brush, dry brush, dry brush. So we're going to do that over the entire blue model, the entire blue surfaces of the model. Like all the other great houses in the first succession war, House Davion fell into war and destruction with its neighbors. The first enemies that House Davion or the Federated Stuns uh, waged war against were the Capellan Confederation, and they made steady gains into their territory and in wins at the early portions of the First Succession War. However, the Draconis Combine from the north did a sneak attack and began their invasion in May of 2787 into the Federated Sons, Delacruz being the first of the worlds that were attacked. Eventually, the Draconis Combine fought all the way through the Crucius March and Draconis March and eventually took siege and landed on the capital of the Federated Sons, the world of New Avalon. All right, now that we've dry brushed everything, we've got nice edge highlights on there. We're going to come back with that same blue glaze, and we're going to cover the entire model one more time, relatively thin coat, but use this to kind of deepen and enrich in that blue. And those edge highlights are really going to now pop, be a little bit lighter than the rest of the blue. But get that deep, rich blue by giving it one more coat and giving it a good enough time to dry and get that solid blue coat on, over the entire model. Back to the First Succession War. In the battle that ensued, the palace on New Avalon was destroyed. House Davian was on the back foot and taking heavy losses, demoralized and now fighting a brutal war on two fronts. During this offensive, the coordinator of the Draconis Combine, again known as House Karita, a Minuru Karita, was watching over the unfolding war on Kentaris. A freedom fighter managed to kill the coordinator, and that threw the Karita leadership into disarray for a short time. Minoru's son, Jinjiro, was named successor and the new coordinator for the Draconis Combine. Jinjiro was a madman and a butcher. He ordered his troops to bathe the Kentari civilians in their own blood. What ensued after was a massacre on an unprecedented scale. The Cretan samurai forces did their new coordinator's bidding. The Kentari's massacre of 2796 was the largest single war crime in human history. In three months, House Karita troops wiped out nearly 75% 75 of the population of Kentaris IV as a madness-induced rampage of slaughter and destruction over the loss of their former coordinator. One hour later. Okay, now the moments we've been waiting for. We've got that masking tape on there. We painted all the areas that we wanted blue. Now it's time to take that mask off and uh, see what, what lies underneath.
Ah, yes, the peel. This is the fun part. So while we're peeling this, let's talk a little bit more about House Davian lore. In the aftermath of the Kintaris massacre, when the Karedan forces stood back and observed what they had done, they became horrified and shamed. Many Karedan samurai warriors committed ritualized suicide, or seppuku, in a vain attempt to reclaim face and honor. Even some Karedan warriors who had not participated specifically in the Kentaris massacre, having heard of the deeds done by their brethren in arms, took the lead of those committing seppuku and then they themselves committing suicide. The pause in the action created in this conflict due to the horror that they had wrought gave House Davian the opening they needed, and indeed drove the Davian forces to pick up arms again and rally to repel the Cretan invaders. In time, they forced the Draconis Combine back to close to what was pre-First Succession War's borders. After years of bloody conflict and millions upon millions dead, they mutually agreed to a truce. There was some small measure of progress against the Draconis Combine as well. Eventually, the Second Succession War ended in 2864. Most of the great houses had found that their ability to wage war was not what it was in pre years previous. God, this sucks. There was some small measure of progress against the Draconis Combine as well. Eventually, the Second Succession War ended in 2864. Most of the great houses finding that their ability to wage war was not what it was in years past. Governments, militaries, and civilians were all ground down to the point where fighting the war was no longer sustainable, and so an easy truce and succession of hostilities ensued. Well, I hope uh, you're enjoying this mixed format. I uh, noted that as I'm peeling this, I hope it's not distracting or... Hopefully it's interesting, but leave a comment. What do you think so far? Interesting or just pure lore videos or pure hobby videos? I figured I had some footage that I wanted to share, like how I did this, but there were long periods of, hey, there's some dead air here. Maybe we can fill that dead air with some battle tech knowledge. So I'm kind of mixing formats here. So this is a little experiment. So you tell me whether or not it works or not. More of this, less of this, you tell me. So yeah, carefully peeling off all this tape. Um, you know, once, when you airbrush stuff, you know, it's it's actually fairly hard to scratch. But I still try to um, be a little bit careful. But kind of peeling all these layers off. Sometimes it's a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, figuring out exactly how you taped all this stuff on and kind of getting it off with the least amount of drama. So kind of carefully pulling this tape off. Generally looks like I'm doing a good job. A couple couple screw ups in there, but. Um, it's also a learning process for me is trying to keep this kind of on the camera. You see how I tilted it back there. I remember as I was doing this, I want to make sure that people can see the peel. So that was a pretty good peel right there. But keeping it on the camera and actually being able to see what you're doing and have it interesting to do while you're peeling it so you can see what's going on. People might not know this, but filming these things is actually there's a lot of you have to think about. Like, not only is it showing what you're doing, but you've got to show it in a way that makes sense to the viewer. And, like, me trying to figure out how to do this <laughs> while still showing it on the camera. Getting that set up was a little bit new for me. So some of these angles are going to be a little bit awkward to watch, so I apologize for that. Learning process for all of us. So, yeah, sometimes the tape gets really stuck on there. Don't be ashamed or hesitate to kind of get your hobby knife out under there and peel a little bit. Just be careful. And then you can kind of peel and oh yeah isn't that great isn't that great i don't know if anyone's done this but if you've done masking jobs um in your painting travels i'd love to hear how that went and we're getting to the last bits of tape here and i thought we would narrate this gorgeous money shot here Oh yeah, it's so satisfying pulling that tape off and seeing a nice clean line. 
So that was some pretty good taping on my part there. There's a couple of errors in there, but those are easily fixed, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But we're just about done peeling all this masking off. And uh, so far it's looking good. Let's see what's under this mask. Painted this a while ago, so honestly I don't remember. Uh, this wing looks like it's pretty clean, maybe? Oh yeah, I see there. There's that boo-boo. But we'll fix that. Yeah, a little boo-boo there. That's all right. All right, last bit of tape here. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the cleanup and maybe some more lower. Yep, there's some cleanup we're going to have to do on the bottom there, too. That's That happens. No biggie. And particularly with FDM prints, um, you're going to see that. But there's the finished product. And that looks pretty darn good to me, folks. Um, we've got the base coats down. We've got the base colors down now. Now it's just really a matter of getting to all the details. So we're going to uh, call that success. There's some cleanup to do. But now... Now comes the um, the real work, getting to all the details, and we'll uh, we'll kind of speed up the painting process here, and I'll narrate it a little bit. But essentially, now the goal is detailing and finishing up the final product. All right, like we said, now it's time to uh, fill in all the details. So this is where the other paints come in. I'm going to be using a lot of the base colors as well. They will be using um, Vallejo uh, Game Air White. I think that's a nice, brilliant white, and it comes pre-thinned, and I use that a lot. I'm also going to use Lead Belcher, and I'm going to use Mechanica Standard Gray for the turret, and Lead Belcher there for kind of the metal parts. So let's start with that Mechanica Standard Gray. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of that out of my palette. My palette, folks, is very high-tech. It is the... Um, lid to a ricotta cheese jar or pale container tin i don't know anyways you get the point um gonna paint that uh, turret a nice neutral color and um, my camera work here is not always fantastic folks so sorry but i figure you know how to paint brush uh some colors on there so we're just going to use that Mechanica Standard Gray to kind of make some darker spots on the on the hull, kind of create some interest, some color variation. So I don't know what that the heck that thing is sticking out the side of the nacelle there, but I'm painting it gray because reasons. So give that a quick paint, and then uh, I'm going to go in with some black and some white, and uh, let's see what we're going to do here. So making up some gray here. Very light gray. Ah, yes. So this is the process where um, I'm trying to fix my boo-boos. So it was primed black, um, and then I sprayed uh, white on it. So it's going to be a gradation or a gradient of some kind of whitish to grayish color. So what I'm trying to do here is color match to fix those boo-boos. Now, they're not going to be perfect. Um, and I'll go over this a couple times, but what I bit basically am doing here is like I'm mixing paint to try to match the color on the model. It's not going to be perfect, um, but you get close enough, and I think it, I think it's going to look fine. It's also going to dry a little darker than you see here on the camera. So um, just kind of going around while some of the other um, the turret and those nacelle thingy majabbers on the side there, just fixing up all those little boo boos. Make sure you take care of that because, you know, it would look a little unprofessional of a, a very proper Davian house lord or noble who's maybe in command of that dropship to be having a bad paint job on his sweet ride. Okay, so now with some lead belcher, we're just going to go over, find some areas that you like coloring metal. I just picked random areas. So I don't know what those things are on the top. They look cool, but uh, I decided that those are going to look metal. Um, the engines, the landing gear, um, some of the other bits and bobs like the front. There's um, there's like these bumpers or something on the front. You just kind of paint some of those raised areas to create some interest. I'm going to paint those all lead belcher or whatever kind of dingy metal silver that is your favorite. And paint those all up silver. And then wash them with known oil to kind of give them uh, kind of a, a used metallic look. So yeah, painting those vents, 
we're just going to color a bunch of stuff with the silver and uh, get that all done. So yeah, fast forward, all the silver is done. Now I'm painting the cockpit, that game air black. Now, Greg, why are you painting with a paintbrush your airbrush paints? Well, I do that sometimes because it's nice and thin. It's a nice flat black. I like that black. I like the Vallejo colors because they are nice and flat. Um, and it coats it coats really well. Sometimes it takes a couple of coats because it is pre-thinned for your airbrush. But I like that because it gives a nice, clean, even finish. And it comes out nice and flat. So painting that on, um, getting that all set up there. So, oh, now we're going to go back with the Null Oil with all of the silver or the lead belcher parts and the turret. Going to wash that with Null Oil. Give it some contrast. Not thinned, just straight out of the pot. Make sure it doesn't pool too much. you got to be a little bit careful now because you don't want to mess up the parts that you've already painted right so i'm going to put known oil here on both the paint areas that i painted kind of the flat gray as well as the silver so that's why you're seeing me go over everything it's going to be on the engines it's going to be on um those nacelle bubble thingamajiggers yeah give that a good look just going to go around the whole area. So it's interesting. I think I decided to kind of paint that, give that a little bit of depth, maybe because there's grease or oil or grime in there. But don't be afraid to kind of mix things up, right? Put the colors where they look like they look like they might have the most impact. Yeah, get all those engine exhausts known oiled up. In, in my book, known oil and Agrex Earthshade are essentially liquid talent. They make my paint jobs look better than they actually are. Yep. Then maybe wick a little bit of the excess out of there. So now it's really starting to look like something. Yeah, it looks like I got some null oil there, so I'm just kind of buffing it out. Okay. One of the things that I've noticed is that if you're using known oil or one of those kind of uh, standard GW washes, if you're washing large areas or washing large portions of a model and um, you're leaving the pot open for a while, it settles. And so every couple minutes, every five minutes, maybe, I don't know, give it a good shake because you're going <laughs> to... And I am really um, playing with fire here. I, nowadays, I actually put um, those big GW bottles in a... Um, oh, here I'm making some exhaust. We'll talk more about this in a second. I put those GW bottles in uh, a little holder so I don't knock them over. I don't know how many times I've knocked over a, a big pot of wash and kicked myself at the end. But sometimes here's what I do. Um, I use a little bit of known oil to kind of make some um, exhaust soot. There's a better way to do this. Sometimes I will also use um, Vallejo has a black primer that is super duper extra flat. And so I'll be doing some of the dry brushing on that to kind of um, give that exhaust look. Where you need to, eh, it looks like I found another boo-boo that I didn't clean up. So let's go ahead and clean that up. Probably worth it. The Third Succession War lasted from 2866 to roughly 3025, starting only two short years after the Last Succession War. The Third Succession War was very different than the ones previous. The full-scale destruction of the first two Succession Wars was replaced with constant lower-intensity warfare, as the technological bases of all the successor states were vastly diminished, as was resources to be fought over and claimed. It is interesting to note that the initial setting of the Battletech game is at the very end of the Third Succession War, roughly 3025, when essentially the entirety of the Inner Sphere had literally been bombed into an earlier level of technological capability. 
The major houses agreed, mostly in unspoken but mutually agreed terms, that the struggle for who would be the successor of the Star League would largely be a contest of limited warfare, no longer pursuing an aggressive war stance of total all-out war. Significant military assets, like jump ships and some warships, were largely considered off-limits. Large population centers were to be avoided, and military engagements were more about seizing military assets, not their destruction. The age of the battle mech warfare had been refined to applying just enough force to see which side blinked first. Sort of a military version of chicken. The loser retreating to come back and fight another day. Wars and battles became less decisive and more about ebb and flow of military light in localized geographies. Things like water reservoirs, battle mech factories, and science facilities became more and more precious and worth fighting over, and major objectives in military operations. Constant warfare was nearly 200 years in the making, and became the norm and faded into the background noise of the time. Notably, in 3020, the nobility of House Steiner Archon Katrina Steiner of the Lyran Commonwealth proposed peace with the Lyran Commonwealth's four neighboring successor states. Only Prince Hans Davian engaged in the peace process. Their mutual interest in lasting peace brought them together for future alliances, which we'll cover shortly. During the Third Succession War, the Federated Sons continued to make gains against the Draconis Combine and Compellan Confederation, taking over or reclaiming at least a dozen worlds from each of them when all was said and done. Yeah, and as you can see, I'm continuing to paint some of these details. Lots of little details here. Getting painted up. It's kind of a slow grind. This is actually sped up at least two, maybe three times faster than I actually move. So, um, again, apologies for some of that camera work. It's really hard to... There we go. See, I'm even trying to change the camera so you can see what I'm doing, but I figure you guys know how to operate a paintbrush, but this is just my process. So getting all these little details painted up. Let's start talking about the Fourth Succession War. The Fourth Succession War raged from 3028 to 3030, only two short years of intense bloody conflict that would change the map of the Inner Sphere more dramatically than many of the conflicts previous. This war nearly rivaled the size and intensity of the Second Succession War over a century ago. This war began immediately after the alliance between the Lyran Commonwealth and the Federated Sons began. The Third Succession War ended with a truce between Steiner and Hal Stavian with the marriage of Hans Davian and Melissa Steiner. At their wedding on Terra, Hans Davian announced publicly that his wedding gift to his wife was the Compellan Confederation. Immediately, Hans began staging a military exercise close to the Capellan Confederation border on a yearly basis starting in 3026. From that, a titanic military operation ensued, with Davion forces blitzing across the Capellan border. You see, Hans Davian had a bone to pick with the Capellan Confederation. Not only had there been constant warfare with their neighbors to the west over the last several hundred years, but in 3025, Chancellor Maximilian Liao was caught attempting to usurp Prince Davian with a body double. This body double doppelganger identified and thwarted, Hans Davian immediately went into action to punish the Compellan Confederation. Had the body double been successful, no doubt the Chancellor would have used that to leverage power and potentially overthrow the Federated Sons in the name of the Compellan Supremacy. Though reluctant to go along with Hans Davian's plan for various reasons, Katrina Steiner agreed and, it, and supported his cause and the invasion. Seeing an alliance between two of the most powerful and richest successor states, the Compellent Confederation, Draconis Combine, and the Free Worlds League attempted a treaty and alliance of their own. This treaty was to be officiated by Comstar. However, years of distrust and misalignment would not create tangible benefits for this newly minted Captain Accords, and the little effect, if any, of this alliance bore fruit for the Capellan Confederation. The offensive launched by Hans Davian in 3028 ultimately would be extremely successful. 
The war brought to heel nearly half of the Capellan Confederation and the new Federated Sons Lyran Commonwealth banner, though technically, as it was a wedding gift, the spoils of the war went to the Lyran Commonwealth. The crushing assault would devastate the Compellent Confederation, and it would be many decades before they recovered. After the Succession Wars, the Federated Sons reached out to and began a secret pact with their neighbor to the west, the Lyran Commonwealth, and between 3024 and 3029, they had an alliance that would eventually, in time, join the two forces into a single house called the Federated Commonwealth. The merging of the two great houses would become official in 3055, but would soon, just two short years later, fall into ruin when they split again and formed the Federated Sons and the Lyran Commonwealth again, leading to the Fedcom Civil War. Okay, now that we've got a lot of the silver or metallic parts painted and washed, um, I'm going to make some um, like soot markings or kind of exhaust markings or kind of like dirt coming out of the um, some of those um, grates and whatnot. So what I did there was I took um, brown gesso or you can take any kind of flat black primer and then I take another one of these eye makeup brushes and use it as a dry brush and what I'm going to do is use that to dry brush out some exhaust so kind of give it a couple of swipes there with your dry brush and that will kind of create this sooty effect and again sorry about the camera angle there but pretty crappy but um, just use that a little bit better job here it looks like kind of Get some soot markings. Yeah, it kind of like diffuse, like kind of covering the whole grate there and maybe a little bit around it too. All that engine exhaust over years and years of service um, really kind of makes it grimy. So just kind of go around the engines here, dry brush your little black, flat black, kind of give it some grime, give, give it some dirt. This, I'm going to um, do some chipping effects too because this, this is a, this is a used dropship, man. This people, Hans Davian and his 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 boys are they're getting some work done in this thing. They're not they're not goofing around. So uh, this thing's been through a little bit of a little bit of use. So also on the front, hey, you know that thing's kind of coming into the atmosphere. It's you know getting a little scorch, you know coming in. Who knows what, right? So give it a little dry brush, grime it up a little bit and do this a couple times to your liking. But I do this um, when I want to grind things up a little bit and kind of make it look a little bit used and weathered. Now I'm going to come in and um, do the cockpit glass. And this is actually really straightforward. Forgive me while I get my camera squared away there. But um, take some white paint. I'm using the um, Vallejo Game Air White again. But you can use whatever white you want. Use your small brush and try to get into those uh, window recesses a little bit and get a nice solid coat. Now this probably takes a few a few coats because you know white over black is not going to you know go perfectly. And here, given that the background is fully black, it's okay that I maybe smear that paint a little bit over the black because I'm going to come back and like uh, clean up those lines around the black edges um, after I'm done here. So, but really the important thing is. Get the cockpit glass a nice solid white, and then we're going to come back. We're going to wash that with some red to kind of give it kind of a, a reddish, you know, glow. And then uh, we'll come back and clean it up with black. So we're just going to go in here, paint each one of those little windows white, and we'll come back and finish up the cockpit glass with some red wash. All right, now we're going to um, do that cockpit glass glow or the bridge glass glow. So I'm going to use Dela Rowney ink. Um, I love this stuff. It's really good ink, um, really effective. And I'm going to, it's pretty glossy. So I'm going to use that and I'm going to thin it down 
quite a bit with Lamy and Medium, um, just because I don't want it to be quite so strong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of glob it in there, but I'm going to glob it in there kind of smartly and try to make sure that a little bit of the center of the window still shows through white, and so it's kind of glowing on the edges red. So, but, you know, it kind of takes a little practice, but just kind of drop some ink in each one of those. And again, it's okay if it's a little sloppy, slops on the outside. We're going to come back and clean that up with some black paint. So get your cockpit glass kind of done there. Get that color in there, not too much. You know, be able to see some of the white so it does look like it's glowing and it's not just solid red. And so do that for each one of the cockpit glass pieces. And here it is all cleaned up. Now we're going to apply some decals. So I made these decals myself. I have a um, video in my um, playlist on how to create and apply decals. So I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but get yourself some decal paper, print your decals off, get yourself some micro set and micro saw, and use those to both soften the decal and apply the decals. So First, I put some gloss varnish on where I want to put the decals. That's going to create a smooth finish for your application of the decal. And then after that, I'm going to go through and apply each one of the decals um, and kind of take the decals, cut them out, measure them to where you think they're going to fit. Put just a very thin coat of the gloss varnish there uh, so the decals have a nice smooth surface to set on. And again, this is in my tutorial for decals, but take uh, the micro set and put the decals in there, get them nice and soft, and then apply them wherever you want and uh, make, your, make your dropship look boss. The two allied factions, House Steiner and House Davian, began the integration of their militaries in 3041. These two houses, now united as a successor state known as the Federated Commonwealth, was essentially a superpower leading up into the clan invasion of 3049. During the clan invasion period, the Crucius Lancers served the Federated Commonwealth well, though only the second Crucius Lancers witnessed serious fighting during the clan invasion. The Federated Sons and the Lyran Commonwealth were remained together until the Lyran succeeded from the Alliance in 3057. The Fedcom Civil War was a devastating war. It lasted from 3062, shortly after the Lyran Commonwealth seceded from the Fedcom Alliance, to 3067. For five years, House Davian and House Steiner brutally raged, waged war against each other, destroying incalculable assets and slaying millions of lives. Several other factions, including the Draconis Combine, were involved in the war. Eventually, the Free Worlds League, the Capellan Confederation, and even Clan Jade Falcon took advantage of the situation to join the fray to annex territory or take advantage of the distraction while others warred with each other. The exact outcomes of the Fedcom Civil War are hard to summarize. However, it demonstrated the primary product of the Inner Sphere continued to be war, even after the brief consolidation of power was realized in unity across the inner sphere to deal with the clan invasion. Last but not least, as you've got your applied decals on there, put some microsol on there to dissolve all the non-paint portions of the decal so that really all you've got left is the paint that was the decal uh, adhered to your surface. So I do that a couple of times, blot away any excess, do that a couple of times, get it nice and adhered to the model. Then when that's all dry, I come back and do a couple of thin layers of Lamy and Medium to make it nice and flat. And that, my friends, is a wrap. So that is the video that I uh, plan to do for this uh, this uh, Davian dropship. A um, little bit of lore sprinkled in, mostly kind of a history in the founding and uh, their activities during the succession wars and how it impacted House Davian. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you like this sort of thing, let me know. If you uh, like to see other things, drop me a line and give me some feedback and see what you think of this. And uh, 
let me know what your thoughts are. So, hey, thank you so much for watching. I hope uh, maybe this inspires you to get a piece of dropship terrain for your table just for the fun of it or just to paint it. These uh, these models are a lot of fun to paint and they can really be nice centerpieces uh, for your collection and for your tables if you're if you're gaming. So, again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.